Welcome back, everybody. I would let, now like to introduce to you Ken Pienta. Ken is a professor at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, and he's also the director of research for the James Buchanan Brady Urological Institute. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, thank you. It's so good uh, to be here, and I really appreciate uh, everybody who's taking part in this conference and anybody, everybody who's speaking at it. It's it's an amazing event. Uh, I'd like to spend uh, a a few minutes today talking about uh, our thoughts about uh, convergent evolution and lethal cancer. I want to really stop and say, look, guys, cancer is an ongoing health crisis. It's killing 10 million people a year globally. Uh, in the United States alone, that's 600,000 people uh, dying every year from cancer. That's one person dying every minute. And we need to keep reminding people that this is a health crisis that as Azra so well pointed out at the beginning of this, this symposium, we don't have the answers yet. And this conference is about finding those new answers. Just again, to put that in perspective in a graphic, 20 million people a year are diagnosed with cancer. About 10 million of those are cured with local therapy, either surgery or radiation, but 10 million of them have their cancer progress with metastatic and therapy resistant to disease. And what, and I, again, I wanna emphasize it, it's not infectious. That cancer is arising in each individual person uh, and getting to the same place, this convergent place of therape therapeutic resistance and metastasis. It's a convergent lethal cancer phenotype that we need to explain. Convergent evolution is the independent evolution of similar features across species uh, of different periods or time, you know, epochs of time. It creates an analogous structures that have similar form or function, but were not present in the last common ancestor of those groups. Um, you know, wings, hooves, teeth, eyes are all examples of convergent evolution that we see in Earth history. But what are the convergent uh, traits of lethal cancer? Well, cancer kills people for two reasons. It, number one, it spreads to all parts of the body, well, that's metastasis. And number two, it's resistant to all known forms of systemic treatment. So traditionally, that's been thought, explained by the thought that within the billions of cancer cells in a tumor, resistance to therapies evolves by random chance that endows at least one cancer cell with resistance to any particular therapy. That explanation relies on chance, since lethal cancer demonstrates that resistance to therapeutic agents that, is, that it has not seen before. How is that possible? Well, classically, metastasis and resistance are considered two distinct processes attributed to tumor heterogeneity and studied by essentially different groups of scientists. One of the, one of the things that we've been working at in our laboratory over the last several years is can we explain metastasis and resistance within a single silo of study? Uh, how are they possibly related? To do this, um, we worked with uh, Bob Austin, uh, the physicist from uh, uh, Princeton and a great friend and his grad student, Casey Lynn and um, uh, my postdoc, Gonzalo Torga. And we built basically a microfluidics device to model metastasis and resistance, uh, so, something we called the cancer swamp. Uh, the, the idea of this and the secret sauce of this uh, device was that it create, we can create a gradient of stress. Um, and as you see here, this fluorescein gradient, at the bottom, there's high dose of stress and at the, at the top, it's low. And we can use therapy there, we can use oxygen, we can do all kinds of different stresses. But the idea here is that we're actually creating a microfluidics device, an environment where the cancer cells will get different gradations of stress and then we can track that over time. 
So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a movie of PC3 prostate cancer cells um, that are ex being exposed to uh, high dose chemotherapy in the lower right hand corner. And, and, and that diffuses to low dose in the upper left hand corner. And we're gonna follow this over two, a two week period. We have two kinds of PC3 cells in here. The green ones are have a mesenchymal phenotype and the red ones are an epithelial phenotype. And what you see in this movie is that the, uh, you see the clearing out of the cells in the lower left, uh, but then over time, what you see are the emergence of these very large cells that are moving around very fast. And, um, uh, all, and then you see a sort of a clonal outgrowth. And what that left us with is the question, what are these very large cells? And then what are this, these very small ones? To cut to the chase, what I'm gonna tell you about are what we call polyaneuploid cancer cells, uh, otherwise known as polyploid giant cancer cells. And I'm gonna show you data that says they're both aneuploid and polyploid. They're highly motile, highly resistant, and they seed cancer recurrence. These uh, 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 PACs were first described in 1858 by Rudolf Virchow, the father, father of modern pathology, when he noted various polymorphous cancer cells, some of them in a state of uh, degeneration with multiple nuclei. Uh, uh, I think Jim yesterday showed Bovary's uh, slides of, uh, of, uh, like this from a little later, but these were, from the very beginning, these have been seen, and of course, um, Dr. Liu, who's a founder of this field, is going to be talking tomorrow, but uh, multinucleated polyploid cells have been reported in the literature uh, since the time of Virchow, and they've been associated with therapeutic in uh, interventions like chemotherapy, radiation therapy, low oxygen, low pH, and, uh, but it has been assumed by the majority of the cancer community that these giant polyploid cells don't survive and die due to mitotic catastrophe subsequent to multipolar cell division or that they simply senesce. So the idea was, oh, they're somehow associated with the, the stress, but again, except for a few leaders like uh, Jinsong, everybody believes they're just not important. We think they're actually centrally important and they're the central actuators of tumor genesis, metastasis and therapeutic resistance. Here in the upper left-hand panel, you see uh, cancer cells in tissue culture prior to treatment. And then uh, in the middle panel after treatment, you see this, the, the formation of these uh, polyaneuploid cancer cells. They're not just in tissue culture, they're present in every uh, tumor model, uh, gem or orthotopic model we look at uh, here in the lower left-hand corner. They're present, if you know how to look for them, in human tumors. And uh, pathologists usually use an H&E section like that on the left, you can't see the cell borders. But if you stain with EPCAM for the cell periphery, you can easily put, find uh, these uh, uh, polyaneuploid cells in metastatic and primary tumors. And if you know what to look for, you can find them as rare circulating tumor cells. Uh, working with Peter Kuhn at USC, who developed the uh, uh, Epic Biosciences platform, uh, we looked for these cells and, you know, Peter's done 10,000 patients uh, looking for circulating tumor cells. And I said, Peter, have you ever seen one of these? He goes, no. The very next day, a student sent me these and he goes, oh my gosh, my computer algorithms throw those out as megakaryocytes. And now that he's changed his algorithm, we can find these routinely in the patients uh, who have metastatic cancer. We find them in all cancer types. Uh, in the, you can find them in any tissue culture flask. I challenge you to go to any culture flask that you have in your labs and you'll find these as a small percentage of the, 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 the population, two to 5%. You can find them, and there have been reports across the literature 
of these cells. And pathologists have talked talk about them all the time. They just say, oh, they're, they're not viable. Well, they are viable. So we know now that uh, PACs are relevant to human cancer, that they're not just cells grown in a lab. And I'd like to show you a, a bunch of unpublished data about what we've learned and why we think these are so important. So I think one of the very first questions is, why have we missed these for so long? They are sitting there in tissue culture, but our eyes are trained to ignore them. I've been doing tissue culture for 30 years and never bothered to think about them. And in fact, when we do as, you know, assays, viability assays, you know, we pour in the dye, we count how many cells are viable. Who looks under the microscope anymore? Well, if you do, you'll see that at 72 hours at a lethal dose 90, the only thing left in the tissue culture flask are giant cells, are these polyaneuploid cells. And we have to bring this into our paradigm of how do we understand cancer resistance and metastasis. So we know that these are physically larger and have more DNA than typical parent cancer cells. Um, here with Sean's son, we looked at the, the volume on the left and they, these cells are typically about eight times the volume of parental cells that they come from. We talk about, well, how do you describe the ploidy of a cancer cell? All cancer cells in general are aneuploid. So we call that 2N plus aneuploidy. And then if you look at a parent population of cancer cells in a flask, you'll see that some cells are doubling, going to 4N plus, but uh, polyaneuploid cells have doubled and are staying there. So they're 4N plus cells. This is extreme. So we know they're aneuploid to start with, but they're polyaneuploid. They've doubled and quadrupled their DNA content. We know that they're um, morphologically distinct and they have a regular nuclei. Here on the left is a uh, sort of a quote unquote normal uh, PC3 cell, prostate cancer cell. You see a nucleus there, but uh, when you look at um, in our confocal image here of a polyaneuploid cancer cell, you see these large misshapen nuclei. And this is really important because in two dimensions, we think of these cells as multinucleated, but they actually may be multilobulated single nuclear cells. And that is something that uh, Chiju Kim and Athen, Athen Olson in the lab are trying to figure out for us right now is how many of these are actually single nucleated uh, aneuploid cells versus multinucleated, because that gives us clues as to where this, this happens. We also know that uh, more uh, polyaneuploid cells are formed after treatment, regardless of therapy type or cancer cell line. So we've used every, uh, basically every kind of chemotherapy uh, in addition to low oxygen, low pH, high pH, uh, but also radiation. And you see the dose dependent uh, induction of these polyaneuploid cells. The more you stress, the more you get. Um, and it doesn't matter. It's stress agnostic uh, it, and, and these cells are formed uh, to become therapeutically resistant. And in fact, if you look uh, again, in tissue culture, about 10% of cells, or excuse me, 3% of the cells are uh, polyaneuploid cells sitting there in tissue culture. But when we treat uh, for 72 hours, we get about, uh, and instead of 30,000, we get 300,000 of these cells. These are the cells that are left after therapy. We have to explain how this cell, straight, cell state transition happens. And in fact, we know that they can be formed by multiple mechanisms. Uh, they can be formed by cell fusion, and we do see that. But here's a movie. Um, again, Jim showed one of uh, uh, Jin Sung's uh, movies, and he'll probably show one. But aborted cytokinesis, it seems to be a major way that these cells are formed. And here we're proving not only are they formed, they're, they're viable afterwards. They're not going through senescence. They're not, they're not dying. Uh, at all. So how do they survive this? Well, they survive it by going into quiescence. We've labeled ourselves with, with Laura Butita at the University of Michigan. We've labeled ourselves with Fuji labels. 
to let us say where we are in the cell cycle. And now we can say that, uh, that all, basically all of the cells that persist after 12 days of chemotherapy, they are in G1, G0, they, they're staying in red, as you can see here in this picture. And what's really fascinating is if you think about it, what we're noting is to survive the therapeutic insult, to go into quiescence, the cells have to go for some reason through S and G2, and then they just don't get all the way through mitosis. They skip to an endocycle to go into G0, G1. A regular 2N uh, aneuploid cancer cell can't, does, isn't able to exit to G0, G1. You have to go through this uh, cycle uh, in double. And I think that's a really important point that's not been well appreciated. We know uh, that uh, these cells are uh, not only qu quiescent, meaning they've paused their proliferation, but they also are highly motile, as I showed you in that original movie, but also in our data here, Michaela Malin in our lab has demonstrated they, these move about twice as fast as um, uh, normal or normal 2N plus uh, cancer cells. Uh, and that she's shown that with PC3 data cells, uh, prostate cancer cells on this graph on the left. And then George Butler from uh, University of Reading in the UK has shown, done this with uh, MDA MB231 breast cancer cells. So um, how another thing we found here, Lori Kosteka in the lab has noticed that these cells have different metabolism. And in fact, they have increased fat stores and lipid droplets. Uh, when I showed these cells to Bob Gillies at the Moffitt with Bob Gattenby, Bob said, oh, they must, they're full of lipid. And sure enough, when we stained with Nile Red, you can see these beautiful lipid droplets. And we believe that the PACs are using these fat stores to survive uh, while stress is present, uh, which allows them to be dormant. We've also looked uh, at, in, um, by gene expression uh, at what these cells are expressing, and they have upregulated stem cell programs, metastasis programs, and resistance programs. Here in this heat map, blue is cool, uh, or you know, sort of yellow is hot. And what we're seeing is that these cells do cross all disciplines uh, by having these stem, metastasis, and resistance programs active. So PACs are resistant cells that form in response to stress. They survive therapy, they're highly motile, uh, and their key attributes are that they undergo whole genome doubling. So they're polyploid and aneuploid, which is why we have elected to call them PACs and not just PGCCs. And that the num second thing they do is they exit from the cell cycle in their quiescence. So how can this be explained? Well, um, as has been alluded to by several speakers, the ability to access programs, uh, polyploid programs, enables the formation of these cells. And they, these polyploid programs can be found throughout evolution, all the way back to protists, and they can uh, be found in several normal cells that uh, uh, normal tissue through potential development programs. And um, if you think about what those programs can be doing, um, th there's basically four models that need to be explored. The first is the tumor cell heterogeneity model where, yeah, the cancer cells already had the mutation present, but for some reason they have to go through this uh, uh, PAC phenotype cell state transition before they can clonally outgrow. And that, it's not for some reason, it's to survive stress, it's to protect their DNA. The quiescent state model where it says there is no uh, mutation present before the stress, it's actually just the idea that you have to, that by forming this polyaneuploid cell, you become quiescent and that's actually your resistance mode. The, another classic model is an evolutionary triage model where um, the, the extra genomic material is used to spin off a, a bunch of variants. Most of those die until you find the resistant outgrowth. And finally, as we just heard in the previous talk from uh, Drs. Bussey and Davies, 
the idea, there could be this idea of uh, stress-induced mutation or adaptive mutation, a self-genetic modification model where these cells actually take the time to figure out a resistant uh, a mechanism uh, for a directed rearrangement to generate the resistant clone. All these are testable and we're actually testing them in the lab. But we do know that PACs can give rise to a recurrence of a typical size cells. Here we've induced them with platinum after 75 days. You see clonal outgrowth of the uh, 2N cells that are now also resistant to, th to therapy. And how is this done? Well, we do know, we don't call them stem cells, but we know that they have stem cell properties. They're uh, expressing uh, all the canonical stem cell markers like KLF4, NANOG, OC4, and SOX2. And we've shown over and over again with multiple models how uh, cell packs are induced. And then over time, they go back to being a couple percent of the population. So we know that they can divide through, uh, they can repopulate through multiple mechanisms. One of those is we've seen night meiosis, and here's a picture of that, uh, not a live picture, but also here uh, again is a movie of asymmetric uh, division of the breast cancer cells, MDA-231s, form uh, a pack forming three uh, progeny. So uh, we can, they, they divide back into cells uh, of sort of normal aneuploid DNA amount. So to summarize, um, we believe that, um, sorry, therapeutic resistance through polyaneuploid cancer cells is actually a hallmark of lethal cancer. The hallmarks of cancer as we've seen earlier today really explain the phenotype of tumorigenesis, but they don't explain therapeutic resistance. And this therapeutic resistance as a hallmark of lethal cancer is clearly enabled, in my mind, by polyploidization and reversible cell cycle arrest. And if we're gonna uh, figure out how to treat these cells, uh, we have to, we know that cancer evolves resistance to all known, known therapy. We believe this is resistance is achieved through a PAC phase. Uh, and to, to attack that, we're thinking about applying evolutionary double bind therapy, where we uh, basically, uh, an evolutionary double bind is, gives the idea where you uh, treat, uh, Bob Gattenby talked about this earlier, we're going to use traditional anti-cancer therapies to induce the evolution of PACs, and then we're going to have to come up with a PAC-directed therapy for cure. Sounds like a great idea. Um, I'm out of time, and I just want to show you this slide that we're working hard on this idea, that we have several ideas for PAC-directed therapy to be used in, with classic cytotoxic therapies. And um, the, uh, so uh, what I've shown you today um, is that we believe that yes, tumor cell heterogeneity is important, but ce cancer cells are, survive stress by accessing uh, evolutionary and developmental polyploid programs which cause the pause proliferation, makes the cells motile. It explains the metastatic cascade that these are the important emigrators that uh, uh, immigrate as dormant disseminator tumor cells, and also that they are therapeutically resistant. I'd like to thank our whole Super PAC team, especially as uh, especially Sarah Ammond, who co-runs the lab with me, and all of our collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. That was a, a, a wonderful introduction to giant cells and what they can do in, in, uh, in, in cancer evolution. Uh, there are some questions here uh, in the chat room. Um, Henry Hang wanted to point out that giant cells are phenotype, the chaotic genomes are the genotype. And uh, one of the things that uh, struck me and I tried to highlight in my talk was that the, the uh, multipolar cell divisions of these giant cells uh, lead to chromosome rearrangements and restructurings. Well, so 
I think it's interesting. I, I think we don't know, um, quite frankly. Uh, and, and, and we need better, uh, we need to get as many people working on this as possible because uh, I think any of those models that I laid out are possible. And uh, what we do know, uh, what I think is really important is that, is that this is a two-step process. The first step is you have to go through this genome doubling and you have to pause your proliferation to survive uh, the, the, the stress insult. And then we aren't quite sure what's happening to get to the next step of survival, you know, depolyploidization and resistance. All those things could be in play. What's really interesting to me is that when we walk, follow these by movies, we don't see death. What we see is that we see the, the survival of these polyaneuploid cells. And then when they do have the clonal outgrowth, even in the presence of the stress, like the chemotherapy, the whole clone grows out. You don't see a bunch of uh, clones dying off um, so we're not, I don't understand the genetic instability that's happening there. And that makes us think that this is more likely uh, one of the other models. Um, and, and the other thing is, is by whole genome hybridization, we actually don't see uh, a bunch of rearrangements uh, happening uh, between the uh, uh, parental cancer cells and uh, the polyaneuploid cells. Hmm, very interesting. I was thinking on your model of having a, a resistance to the uh, treating the 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 the, the PACs, uh, What about uh, some of the signaling pathways which are are necessary for their formation? Yeah, so that's a, a it's a great question, and uh, it's certainly on our list. And uh, you know, one of the things that we're really interested in now that we know that we sort of are forced through this uh, this doubling program is where are they exiting? Um, you know, are they exiting uh, at the spindle assembly checkpoint? Are they exiting uh, uh, later than that in early uh, mitosis or late mitosis? Because I think uh, we can get a, a, some clues about what's driving them and what we are, can potentially target uh, by knowing those answers. And again, I think that there's just not enough of us. Um, you know, I'm a late comer to the field. Sarah and I are late to the to the game here compared to many people in the field. Um, but I think we, we need to wake the cancer community up that these are central actuators of, of resistance. And um, there's a question here about uh, the role in met metastasis. Uh, metastatic tissues contain a minority of these polyploid giant cells. What is their contribution to metastasis? Does it revert to a closer to normal phenotype after integrating to distant sites? Yeah, so we believe, thank you for the question, we believe that uh, you know, uh, when you look at circulating tumor cells, 99.9% uh, .9 of them die in the circulation uh, and are not uh, relevant to metastasis. We are, we're, we are setting out to prove through experiments that actually these circulating uh, polyaneuploid cells are the uh, actuators. They're already dormant. They can sit and be dormant. Uh, for example, in prostate cancer going to the bone marrow, for years uh, and sitting there for years, but what will happen is eventually they uh, uh, they will uh, depolyploid and start uh, cause a recurrence. So uh, they're they're not going to be the central uh, number. They're not going to be an overwhelming majority, but they are the seed. We believe. Yeah, that's exactly what Bovary was saying in 1914. Yes, uh, we're, we're setting out to prove him right. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. That was a fabulous uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh,